This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Today's message is, is entitled, The Power of the Shepherd's Staff in the Last Days, and believe it or not, this is part 59 of Understanding the Kingdom. I had Sheila Lazinski ask me this week, are you on about part 100 yet? And uh, we'll eventually get there, I think. But the break that I had in December, one of the things that it showed me is with, you know, it's so easy to get busy in ministry, and there's constant phone calls, there's constant emails. And, you know, sometimes, especially with a seminary, somebody can give me a, a, a three-line email that may take me three days to accomplish for them. And a lot of times I find myself rushed in preparation for, the, for, the, for these. Uh, it's many times rushed in putting things together for the podcast. And I really have not taken the time to research as I should. And one of the things that I'm beginning to realize, if I don't, things suffer. Uh, during this time, I began to, uh, to really work because there was a gap between the introduction to the kingdom priesthood and the rest that I had already outlined, and it was frustrating that I couldn't bridge that gap. And until I began to really research and doing some word studies in the Hebrew this last month, I got the final pieces of the puzzle that literally flows from Genesis to Revelation. And I want to get into a part of that today. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. You know, the interesting thing about the first two chapters of Genesis is not only is it the creation story, but there's parts of Genesis 2 that happened before Genesis 1.28. When you read that God commissioned Adam and said, listen, I'm, uh, I want you to keep and to, I want you to guard the garden. I want you to till the garden. And, and that word keep in Hebrew means to guard, literally as an armed guard. And that actually occurred before Genesis 1.28, because it was before he created Eve, but yet when in this narrative, Eve was standing there right next to him. And so even before going into this, Adam already knew that he was to guard the garden. And as God begins to speak this, and starting in verse 28, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And, and I have commented on a lot of these on how that the blessing of God was separate from the commands. In English, both in English and Hebrew, the blessing is a separate statement. And then after the blessing, he proceeds to speak these commandments to them. And one of the interesting things about Barach in Hebrew, when you look at it, not only means to bless, it means to fill with strength. So before he said, listen, I'm getting ready to give you your marching orders, but before I give you your marching orders, I'm going to fill you with strength so that you can keep them. Because I really think that we need to change our paradigm about what happened in the garden after the serpent came in. I've had, I've had some guys, when I get into it, just really get in my face and say, Adam didn't have a snowball's chance in hell to be able to stand up against the, the, the Nehesh in the garden and if that's true, then it wasn't a temptation, it was a setup. And we're going to discover this morning that that was not true. 
that God gave Adam everything that he needed to withstand the temptation in the garden, and yet he chose to do it anyway. That's why when when we look at the, many theologians, when you look at the sin of Adam in the garden, he committed high treason against God. And I begin to really begin to take these words apart and and doing an in-depth Hebrew study on them. And one of the ones I wanted to zero in on is, in the King James it says replenish, in the New King James it says to fill, and there is this long-standing argument, is it to fill or replenish? Because if it's replenish, then it proves the gap theory between Genesis 1 and 1-2 that that when Lucifer fell, he basically decimated the planet. And there's actually proof within our solar system. We have a planet destroyed. There's now an asteroid belt. Uh, it used to be called Rahab. And, and literally in the prophets, God is telling the prophets, remember when I, when I splintered Rahab, that planet, as well as it decimating the atmosphere on Mars. And in fact, you know, all, all of the planets have, a, have an access and it's either straight up or like the earth is sli- slightly. We have one of our planets that it's sideways like this. So there was actually something, there was a war or something that moved through the solar system that literally threw the planet 45 degrees off its axis. And so there, there, there is actually evidence, physical evidence in astrophysics proving that there was a conflict within our solar system. And so I really wanted to dig down and find out. And so I'm going I'm to dig down and find out what all the Hebraists say. And that's just a fancy word for the experts in Hebrew. And you know what I found? Half of them are in this camp, half of them are in that camp. I found that out with, when, as soon as I got into Genesis 1-2, they all divided. They couldn't come into consensus. So I'll look at the, all the commentators and what they said and all the study notes. Half are on this side. Half are on this side. So you know what? I've discovered there's just some things you're not going to definitively prove until you get to heaven and you ask the Lord. But as I, as I was studying this word to fill or replenish, I began really drilling down in all the lexicons and different things that I have. And of course, it means to, to fill. And it's the Hebrew word male. Uh, what's interesting, just a, just a side note for those in English, it is actually spelled male, M-A-L-E in English, but it's pronounced male. And I find it funny that the first male didn't use it <laughs> when we get into Genesis 3. But I really begin to, because I wanted to look at the historical etymology or the development of the word as it, as it, as it goes through Hebrew Scripture, because it's, it's very similar to what I, what I deal with in, in being able to properly interpret the word, the principle of first mention. It establishes it, and then it expands in definition. The definition never changes, just our understanding of it expands. And you will see that linguistically with many of the words and how they're used in their various forms within the Word of God. And so I looked it up in Halot, or the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, and it absolutely blew me away. This same word, to fill the earth, means to fill someone's hand and to consecrate as a priest. See, multiply is different than fill. And they almost sound like they're redundant, don't they? You know, and, but multiply is through sexual union within marriage. You, you have kids, and those kids have kids, and as you do, you're going to begin expanding, and the garden would have expanded in the earth as they kept on growing in number. And how is that different than fill? Because they were supposed to enforce God's kingdom as they continued to move forward. They were, Adam was the original priest on planet earth for God. That in this word male, God consecrated him as a priest in the earth, and his children were all to be priests. And we'll even see this throughout the word of God. You can go where when uh, in, in the children of Israel, when they went to Mount Sinai, God spoke and set the whole mountain on fire. I, I, I always look at that, and I, I can imagine Moses saying, dude, I want to show you the burning bush. Come and see the burning bush. And he shows up, and God sets the whole mountain on fire. And the book of Hebrews said even Moses was scared. <laughs> he said, I didn't think he was going to set off an A-bomb. I just wanted to show you the bush, you know. Uh, but with that and with the power of that, because God was saying, listen, I'm more powerful than all the gods I conquered in Egypt. I'm now your God. 
and you're coming into covenant with me. And he manifested his power, but when he did, it so frightened the Jewish people of Israel that they said, you talk to Moses. They kind of pushed Moses out in front and says, you talk to him, he talks to us. You tell him we do, okay? Because of that, God said, I'm going to separate a priesthood for me. He separated the tribe of Levi. The Levites ministered to the people, but there was a subset that were the sons of Aaron, who was also a Levite. His sons would become the Kohanim, or the ones that ministered to God. And so right there, the priesthood was broken in two, and it separated. But one of the things when God did that, he said, I I would that you would have been a nation of priests. All of Israel was God's intention to be priests which, by the way, is restored in the New Covenant. Peter says says that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's restored through Messiah. So that was God's original intent. It flows all throughout the Word of God. And so here you have a priest in the earth that God puts on guard. But I even drilled down further in this Hebrew word, malay, and the uh, Lexham analytical lexicon of the Hebrew Bible brings out this, and it uses 2 Samuel 23, 7 as a, as a proof text showing how it's used within this context. And not only does it mean, okay, I want you to go out and go out into all the earth. I want you to go out and fill all the earth. I want you to be my priest, carrying my kingdom out in the earth. But then it goes on and it says, to be armed with weapons. I mean, that just shot up my radar armed with weapons to be prepared for a military confrontation by being uh, provided with weapons. And so when he commissioned him, he armed him spiritually to carry out everything that he was telling him to do. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, let me me go to the the, the fourth level of, of Torah interpretation, the Zod level. And I looked at the three Hebrew letters that make up the word Malay. And it's Mem, Lamed, and Aleph. And Lamed is the shepherd's staff. It can be a gold, but primarily it's the shepherd's staff. And so you have Mem on the one side of it. Mem is chaos. And on the other side of the staff, you have strength. So... He was armed with a shepherd's staff that had the power to overcome chaos. That was the armament that Adam was given. And I looked at that, and so we find shepherd's staff. In other words, Adam was the first priest. He was the first shepherd. Oh, my because that connects threads all throughout the word of god you have the prophets crying there are no real shepherds in israel why because they're doing like adam and they put their own carnal desires over the task that god had assigned them to Uh uh-oh so in the very beginning adam was loaded for bear Man, I look. I, this this is why I need to spend the time researching. But it's not just something lost. We're going to find it something that has been regained and something even more powerful added to it. Oh, we're going to have fun. Let's go to to Genesis chapter three, one through six. Turn to your neighbor and say, and say there's a, there was a weasel in the garden. I'm going to show you where there, we, we know that there was a snake in the garden, but there was a weasel in the garden too. And his name was Adam. Now, this is where, this is where the neck hash, now later on in its etymology it became known as serpent, but he was a seraph or a dragon, came to Eve in the garden. He set that tree on fire with his presence and he begins uttering promises. It says, now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the, no, of the, the, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now remember in Genesis 2, God told Adam when he was by himself, The day that you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. You know, that, that's, to us it would sound, this is poison, don't eat the arsenic, it'll kill you. Don't eat it. Don't we, don't we tell little kids that all the time? You know, don't drink the Drano, don't eat out the dog food bowl. I mean, there's a lot of things as they're toddlers that you're trying to teach them basic protocols. Don't eat out of the garbage can, you know. God said, don't eat it, if you eat it, it'll kill you. Okay, and so the, the, serp, the serpent is asking her the same thing. But I want you to notice what the devil does. He first questions God. Has God really said? And then he comes back in verse 4 and says, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye will, You shall not surely die. For God knoweth that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And there's a whole understanding of that that, we, that I've not really even covered here that Adam was going to begin deciding for himself what was right and wrong instead of God. That, that Adam would give the commands, not God. And when you understand that, you see that every day on television. We have many on the left that hold up a clenched fist, the clenched fist of communism, by the way, and say, we don't care what, co what the Constitution says, we will do it this way. We have atheists say that there is no God. We make the decisions here. That's all of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if there is a creator, then he sets the rules and we're all responsible to him. Even the angels have to appear before him and give an account for what they did. The angels have a judgment. We're going to have a judgment. Because he's the creator, and that's what, that's what this fruit did with him. No, I'm going to be God. I'm going to say what's right and wrong, and I'm rejecting. And when Adam did that, he cut himself off from the power of God. Because they're wrapped in the commandments. But I want to go a little bit further here. Okay, so verse 6. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Hey, Hillary, it looks good. How many know some of the most deadly fruit on the planet are all the one, also the ones that look the most yummy? Okay. And it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree that desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And what everybody misses, all the guys miss, is the next part of the verse. And also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Adam was standing there the whole time. She didn't sin and then go find Adam and tempt him into sinning. And I've, I've heard a lot, I've, I've actually heard preachers say, you know, woman, she's the one who tempted the first man into, into sinning, and men have been sinning ever since. No, she didn't. It is never considered the sin of Eve by any rabbi, by any Christian theologian. The Bible clearly says she was deceived. Her husband was standing right there, and he was silent. In fact, there, there have been many volumes written on the complexity of the silence of Adam. He didn't say a word. He's sitting there with a staff in his hand, whether it was a physical staff or one built within him, that he could have knocked that nekesh from one end of the garden to the other, and if the thing began to fight back, he could call for backup, called Almighty God, saying, you told me to back up this garden, I need backup. Okay? Instead, he sits there with it, and he does nothing. In fact, there's a principle in Numbers 10 that teaches that if, you know, one of the most solemn things that anybody could ever do is go to the altar and make a vow. And within the Torah, it says, if your wife or your daughter that's still under your authority goes and makes a vow... Come back, comes back and tells you as the male over it, and you disagree with it, the first time you hear it, you can nullify that vow, say, I do not agree with it. Heaven okay, says, okay, the man disagreed with it. That is null and void. But because of the silence of Adam, he says, but if you keep your mouth shut, and then later on it all turns to, you know, turns to garbage, you cannot say, well, I should have, you know, you, you shouldn't have done that, because God says, you kept your mouth shut, so now it's on you. Not the woman, on you. 
Because you were sitting there with the shepherd's staff in your hand and you sat there silent. But I want you to, I want you to look at the sequence of events. God told him, you eat this fruit, you die. He let Eve eat the fruit and stood there. Wonder how long it's going to take for this thing to kick in to see if she dies or not. Weasel. And then when she doesn't die, I'll have some of that too. Not only that, but when God shows up, he throws her under the bus. Is that woman you gave me? Come on. And I, I want to show you the, the humor of God because when in Genesis 3 and 9, when God shows up, and, and this is a classic verse, I've heard many awesome sermons about this. It says, Lord God called unto Abba and said unto him, Where art thou? And I've heard so many sermons about, Adam, where art thou? Because when God showed up, they ran and hid. Now, look, look at the hilarious nature of this. They were promised they were going to become gods. They were going to be like the creator. They were going to be the one in charge. And they were in charge as long as God wasn't there. And the moment God showed up, they all ran and hid. Kind of like what we're going to see in the last days. But this term, Adam, where art thou? Good friend of mine, Dr. Carl Koch, which is a Hebraist, which means he is an expert in the Hebrew. And I remember one time he, he was teaching and he shared this and it absolutely for me. He goes, that is not, he said, that's the polite way of saying what's in the Hebrew. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what's the unpolite way that God really said? God walked in the garden and said, hey, Adam, so how's that working out for you? God knew what he did before he ever showed up. And to do it, he had to lay down his shepherd's staff to take of the fruit. And he abdicated his authority, which made Lucifer the God of this world, and he's been using that authority ever since. Now, even without the whole salvation issue. Imagine Adam. Now, Adam lived long enough that he died, I can't remember how many years it was before the flood, but it wasn't too far before the flood because he lived to be a thousand years old, almost a thousand. So literally when God said, in the day that, you'll die, that you're going to die, and Peter tells us a year is a, th is a thousand years of the Lord, a thousand years is a day. And so before that thousand years was up, he did die. But he lived long enough to see all the horror of what he had done and how it befell humanity. He saw one son raise up and kill another. He saw all that. It opened the door to where the B'nai Elohim in Genesis 6, the, fa the fallen sons of God came and began to interbreed with humans and began to cause absolute chaos and terror on the land with the, with the, with the produce of what we know as giants are the Nephilim in Hebrew. In fact, when you look, uh, Dr. Uh, Chuck Missler does an outstanding word study on just every name. The closer you get to Genesis 6, the father of Noah, his name was basically, man, it's awful out here. Because, <laughs> you know, when you look at their names, they would name them for something. I mean, oh, <laughs> can you imagine him going up, hey, it's really awful out here, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> Because they, they were devouring up the land. Can you imagine? Now, within some of the ancient extra-biblical texts, they said the original giants, many of them grew up to be up to 480 feet tall. Can you imagine how much food that would take? Or even, I mean, a 12-footer. When, when you get to, to Goliath in the Bible, at nine foot, he was a midget, okay? In fact, he had a brother one of the ones that David had to kill later on, that his name was basically Big One. <laughs> so I guess he was bigger than Goliath. Can you imagine how much calories and how much food intake that they would have to have? And they were devouring the land. Many of the extra biblical texts would go in and they would begin eating humans, which is consistent even after the flood when we look at a lot of things even here in America with, with the Indians and what they talked about. 
They'd run aside buffalo and pick it up and just start having lunch. Can you imagine picking up a buffalo? Adam saw all that before he died. How many know there is consequences for what we do? But in the promise that God gave, he says, I'm going to send one of the seed of woman. Now, what's interesting in that very term is that technically women don't have seeds. They have eggs. But God called it the seed of the woman. It was, it was going to be something that was going to come through a woman that a man was not involved. Because if a man is involved, then you end up having what was embedded in Adam's spiritual DNA, sin. Or the iniquity force was embedded in that. And so we know the, 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 the miracle of the virgin birth, that it was the Holy Spirit came upon her and supernaturally enabled her to conceive. And so there's a reason behind that. But one, some of the terminology of this Adam, and Adam as a shepherd, Adam having a staff of power that could defeat the enemy, really got me interested in some terminologies that we see in the New Testament. Let's go to Second or First Corinthians chapter fifteen, in verse forty-five, and Paul, in rabbinical fashion, is using contrasting. Now we we see that in the Psalms, we see that in uh, in the Proverbs. That many times, even within within Hebraic poetry, there'll be contrast. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born, the first world king the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gathered to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com that's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com.